Hello folks, uh, good evening, uh, my name is Graham Walker uh, and it's my absolute pleasure tonight to take you back to the 80s. Uh, we've got a fantastic little uh, virtual tour to show you about and this is all thanks to Barnsley Museums and the wonderful work that they're doing during lockdown. Now as, as, as we all know, uh, we're not able to get out and about, um, uh, well not as much as we'd like to, um, but Barnsley uh, has, has risen to the challenge uh, and it's actually got some fantastic um, uh, uh, things it's been doing in lockdown, not least of all, uh, creating these wonderful uh, virtual tours. Uh, we took a look at one uh, last week uh, where we were looking around uh, Cannon Hall uh, in, in Barnsley, and that's got to go live uh, properly in a couple of weeks' time. So we, we just give people a little sneak break. There'll be more to come. Uh, but tonight we're looking at, um, at, at this, uh, which is just absolutely fantastic. This is, uh, I grew up in the 80s. Um, uh, it's an exhibition that's full of fantastic things as we're about to discover, uh, not least of all um, uh, wonderful music videos, uh, uh, everything from Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet and Hey, let's not forget our Sheffield heroes. We've got the Human League. Uh, we've also got Def Leppard. And we've got some 60s bands who I'm going to take issue with with the curator tonight because he needs to do more to actually get them uh, uh, to highlight them a bit more. And without further ado, I'm going to actually introduce you to my special guest tonight, uh, who is um, uh, Matt. Uh, uh, and Matt, uh, Matt Fox, who's bringing this fantastic... Uh, Exhibition to Barnsley, Matt. Uh, lovely to see you. Uh, great exhibition. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you very much for uh, having me on to do this little uh, live stream with you. And thank you very much also to Experience Barnsley at Barnsley Town Hall for actually hosting the exhibition. And hopefully, uh, once uh, you know that the uh, the lockdown process eases a bit. Um, people will be able to go in and see it firsthand for themselves. But for now, I think a virtual tour is definitely the next best thing. So we're going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek, as Graham said, uh, for you to enjoy now. We are. Uh, but before before we do that, Matt, um, <clears throat> some people from Sheffield are going to be watching this now. We haven't got the Young League on there. But two of the big bands from the 80s who are a problem, I, you know, amongst my favourites ever and yours, uh, we've we actually discovered uh, and not in the exhibition now that's uh, Evan Seventeen and ABC. What's happening? I know I I do love I do love um, Evan Seventeen and ABC and uh, yeah still actually ABC still making some really great music. So so there there is a little bit of Human League in there 
um, there's a fantastic appearance of them um, performing Don't You Want Me um, on Top of the Pops. And uh, and obviously they've got the Smash Hits cover as well. But yeah, I, I think it's remiss. I think maybe I'm going to try and sneak in a little bit of ABC and, and uh, Heaven 17 as well. They, they deserve their place in the 80s. Oh, well, there we go. That means I can now speak to Martin Glenn and Martin Fry, my friends. Uh, so, uh, look, before we go any further, I'm just going to show people a little bit of, of what this is, this virtual tour. So using some fantastic technology, we're able to actually map the um, exhibition space that um, that you've actually created. Now, this is not computer graphics. This is real photographs that we've brought together to actually show um, this wonderful, wonderful exhibition. And we're going to take people around it and we're going to look at some of these hotspots which, we, which are the information aspects, uh, which is going to tell people a little bit more about um, some of the, the, the absolute wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, um, exhibitions, not just, not, not just artifacts, but also you've got this fantastic, what I call a jukebox wall, where we've got all the uh, uh, vinyls from the area that are up there. And we've also got some fantastic film posters. You can see a little bit as we're just having a quick look around now. Um, where we, you can actually click on, on these things and actually watch the music videos, watch the, the, the film trailers. Uh, and actually, if you click on the objects in the cabinets, you'll find out a lot more information about them all. And there's video content in there. There's all kinds of things. It just looks terrific. And, um, uh, and what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to give you a, a, a real tour of it. But, Matt, before we start, I'm just going to say, um, before we do that, there's some amazing things in it. Where do you keep all this when it's not in exhibition? Well, I should start by saying that um, I, I was born in 1972, uh, just to give a little bit of context. So um, I, I was eight years old in 1980 and 18 years old at the end of the decade. So I really did have my formative childhood years through the 80s. And um, you know, some of the items in the collection are, are things that I actually had back then. Um, other things in the collection are things that I really um, aspired to own, you know, and I really wanted to have a big track toy, but they were way too expensive for my family to buy. Um, I, I really wanted to have a pair of Adidas high top trainers, but I, I, I was the kid that got the Dunlop green flash instead. Um, so this exhibition is a combination of uh, iconic and nostalgic things that I think everybody that grew up during that period will remember because everybody who grew up during that period has a really uh, a shared sense of culture. We didn't have a huge number of different TV channels and uh, we all watched Top of the Pops and got the pop charts from that. Um, so there wasn't the sort of the fragmentation of culture for kids that there, there are today. Um, you know, we, we're all subjected to pretty much the same stuff and um, uh, uh, we've got a lot of it on show in this exhibition. Uh, and Matt, I just, I did want to mention that the fact that um, we, when we spoke earlier and asked you about where you keep this when it's not in the museum? You, you confess to me. Yes. Where do where do you keep it? Oh yeah. Well, actually, my um, I I had two brothers, and we've all moved out of the family home. So uh, mum and dad have got a little bit of extra space. So uh, right. I, I usually keep keep it in their place. Yeah. There, there you go. You can always depend on mum and dad, can't you? To actually, and, yes. and it's quite interesting. Exactly. I, I've just cleared out um, uh, my my parents' home. My, my dad unfortunately passed away, and. Um, and I found some fantastic things, including some film posters. That, now you're telling me these could be worth a fortune, but we, we'll we'll take let's take let's take a look inside and 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 show people how this actually works. Um, and then uh, from there we we can actually talk about some of the great things uh, that's happening. So if I just just show people, this is a kind of a floor plan. Um, if we actually go right down to the entrance, now this is inside Barnsley Town Hall. Um, and this is uh, this leads from Experience Barnsley, which is down this corridor. Now we, we're not showing that part of the museum tonight. Uh, this is just a new temporary exhibition that would have normally been open, but is closed uh, due to lockdown. So, Matt, what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to step inside here and just show people, give them people a left to right, so you can see we've got all the cabinets in the far corner there. You can see we've got the jukebox wall. We've got some fantastic film posters with the Terminator and everything behind. And then up on the wall here, we've also got uh, Indiana Jones and E.T. and, and various other things. Now, we'll not, uh, w when we click on these um, um, information spots, you'll see that actually it brings up uh, not just information that you can read about these, but we've actually also got the, um, the, the, the film trailers and we've also got the, 
um, uh, the, the music videos and the rest of it. And it is terrific. Because of copyright reasons, we're not allowed to actually play that on this stream tonight. But you can actually go in and watch it all on, on, the, um, uh, on the virtual tour. Um, so, Matt, uh, what I'm going to try and do, um, if we can, if I can make this happen, um, I'm, I'm just going to try and bring you in with the uh, tour itself. There we go. Um, and what we can do now, Matt, is is really have a have a proper look round. And and please, folks, um, if you're watching wherever you're watching this from, um, tell us where you're watching. Uh, and also, if you've got any questions for Matt. Um, so give us a big shout out. What we'll do when we've been around this, we'll uh, we'll we'll look to see if we can't answer some of your questions as well. And tell us about your favourite things from 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 the eighties. So let's just show people a little bit of what we were talking about, Matt. So if I click on here, for instance, this brings up the Atari VCS two six hundred. Tell me about it. Well, the uh, the Atari VCS was one of the uh, the, the real uh, video game pioneers and the video games always been a bit of a soft spot for me um the, the vcs had this lovely sort of walnut dash on it and you just can't imagine video game consoles being made with wood anymore but um they did it there and it had the uh, the rubber clad um joysticks and the red fire button and the vcs sold around 30 million um copies so it really sort of um acted as a springboard for the entire video game industry to to, to uh to come out of and um you know some of the games will still be familiar to us today space invaders um pac-man galaxians defender you know it was a real golden age for arcade games and uh, many of them were featured on that console and actually we can even get a bit closer on some of these um, information spots if we if we do what it says and click here you can literally zoom right into some of this and um that, and take yeah, it. That's so incredible. You, can, you can even see the uh, the pac-man uh, cartridge that they used to have i mean this will be alien to a lot of people won't it? when we talk about cartridges when you talk about the brand new sony uh um uh, a playstation that's just opened it's a million miles away but what great fun we had dirt uh, matt yeah i mean absolutely we when um you know the media references back to the 80s you tend to get you know margaret thatcher you get the falklands war you get the miners strike but um as a child none of that was a was a big issue for us you know growing up during that period it was incredibly fun and uh, it was a real period of innovation especially when it came to toys um, when it came to gadgets and video games um we had a real amazing wave of feel good movies as we we'll see and 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 music british music during the 80s was incredible so it was a brilliant time to grow up and uh, a, a lot of the issues that people had back then and sort of see it as a bit of a negative time it it really didn't impact uh on us as children so I, I wanted this exhibition really to focus on what a child's experience of the 80s was and there's over 200 objects in this exhibition for uh, for people to come and, and have a look at and hopefully they're they're in that sort of mint condition just like you remember them from back in the day well one of the things that we've We've got to tell people about as well as what what we used to call i think it was like video wars wasn't it it was the it was would it be the beta max which is this or would it be the vhs tapes that won um and of course it was the vhs tapes now i remember having these thorn and and jvc video cassettes in fact i've still got a load of them up in the attic and i haven't got the art to throw them away but um again you know um people will be looking at this now and thinking well i, I see all this i do this on my phone um, why did you need these big devices to do it? And that shows how far we've come in 40 years, Matt. Oh, the, the, the Betamax was, was a really, you know, proper bit of kit. That particular one retailed for £750 at the start of the decade. And uh, if you inflation adjust that, it's about £3,000 and uh, way beyond most people's budget. So uh, that's the reason why we actually had to rent our video players, which seems crazy today. But uh, uh, the uh, the chain store radio rentals had around um, yeah. five hundred stores around the UK. The, so um, uh, uh, most most households actually sort of had to rent these video recorders, and then of course you had to rent the video cassettes to watch on them, which uh, we'll see a little bit later in the tour. They, they absolutely did. Um, I'm going to show another couple of gadgets before we move on from here. I've got to show this one. This changed the face of music, didn't it, Matt? This was the uh, oh. where, I, where I'm looking at here is the the son, the Sony Walkman. Um, I yes. mean, this literally put music in your pocket. Um, and again, a big cumbersome device compared with a phone these days. But it was a game changer, wasn't it? It was. It was and I mean, and actually, you couldn't take it even deeper and say it was the first piece of personal technology. So it really was the uh, the precursor to, uh, you know, to the phones that we all have today. And um, 
the Sony Walkman was so sort of popular and successful that it kind of became like a brand name, a bit like Hoover for vacuum cleaners. And uh, all that, although lots of other companies came on and uh, created personal stereos, you know, most people ended up just calling them Walkmans by the generic name. If you if you look through this, folks, as well, um, obviously a device you might not be able to see it too clearly, but also just remind you as well that if you jump on, uh, on the on this post itself, we have got a click through so that you can actually explore this at your leisure. Um, we just wanted to give you a little bit of a, a, a taste. Uh, but if you look through some of these information points and you get down to things like uh, this down here, we've got uh, on uh, Wikipedia, if you click on that, it'll bring it up. And actually, you can find out a lot, lot more information in here. I think the other thing that we, we're planning to do, Matt, as well, I think we're... Uh, we're looking at putting some um, some more video content uh, in here, um, and in fact, before we, uh, we before we explore this uh, any further, um, there is a, a video that you uh, just if I just turn around here, just right at the entrance when we first came in, um, you you've actually uh, got a video uh, that you've put up here, which is a bit of a, a send up of the uh, pop pick, isn't it? Uh, welcome to I, I, I grew up in the eighties, and we've actually got that little video clip. So I think uh, what we might do, Matt, we just, might just show that and show people uh, the kind of uh, uh, video content that people can actually access while they're inside here. Hello, Pop Pickers. I'm Matt Fox, curator of the I Grew Up 80s exhibition. And if you remember the 80s, then come with me on a little journey through time as we count down the top 10 nostalgic items. Hi, folks, and welcome to the Top of the Picks. And have we got a countdown for you? Take a look at the freshest and coolest objects from our 80s exhibition, I Grew Up in the 80s. Starting off at number 10 is the Swatch Watch, everyone's favourite 80s accessory. In at 9 is iconic films of the decade and one of the all time classics, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Making their first appearance in the chart at number 8 is the BMX Bike, first appearing in Britain around 1980. The next hit at number 7 is the Addy. That's High Top, made popular by Michael Jordan and wrapped about by Run DMC. They became an aspirational fashion statement for British youth in the 80s and made the plain plimsolls of the previous decade look totally outdated. The highest climate in at number 6, Care Bears, a merchandising phenomenon in the 1980s, encompassing movies, TV, books, games, toys and more. In at 5, the Sony Warman TPS L2, the original personal stereo of the 80s. In high demand, it was the first kind of personal tech preparing the way for today's smartphones. Chart entry of four is the Casio KX101, which earned the title King of Boom Boxes, with 131 individual buttons and dials, including its own keyboard. In at number three, the Atari VCS. With 30 million consoles sold, it could be considered the foundation upon which today's entire video games industry was built. It remains a design classic with rubber clad joysticks, red fire buttons and iconic walnut trim. Another classic in at number two and what got us dancing through the decade, 80s music. Britannia rules the airwaves at a time when British music achieved a level of worldwide success that he hadn't since the height of the Beatles popularity in the 1960s. Favourites include Queen, Genesis, Elton John, Paul McCartney, Davey Bowie, along with new acts Duran Duran, The Police, Eurythmics, UB40, George Michael and Dire Straits. Everyone's favourite and top of the chart at number one is the Rubik's Cube. A craze that generated in an estimated 200 million cubes sold. Speed cubing competitions still take place today. The world record is 3.47 seconds. We hope you enjoyed the countdown. For more awesome 80s memorabilia check out I Grew Up in the 80s from Saturday 24th of October until Saturday the 13th of March. So there you go, Matt. That was um, that was brilliant watching that, by the way. Um, and I, I loved the uh, I loved the smash hits um, uh, uh, from Paige as well. Again, showing the human league, and we, we, we we're going to come we're going to come to that, and we're going to show people that and show people what it, um, what uh, well quite a lot more now in terms of um, in terms of this fantastic exhibition. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to step back inside it. Um, there's just that much to talk about, but I want I want to show people what we've got here. And just remind people as well that um, when we're looking around at things like this, uh, we've got things like the boom box. Um, we've got the uh, the old Steve Davis uh, kids snooker table, which I think a lot of people, particularly Crucible fans, will, will be able to uh, link with. At the back here, we've also got the uh, 
um, uh, the deity Casio. Uh, what? In fact, I was going to wear mine. I actually, I've still got one, uh, and uh, and also the Adidas uh, eye tops. Um, each one of these has got a fantastic story behind it. Um, and when we when we look over onto this direction, also we've got some of the um, uh, the iconic toys as well from the era. Not least of all the Rubik's cube. Just tell me about some of this that we could look at as well, Matt. Well, the Rubik's Cube was in, invented by a, a Hungarian chap called Erno Rubik. And uh, as it mentioned in that, uh, that little um, stream, um, the Rubik's Cube sold 200 million uh, in the early 80s, between 1980 to 1983. That was when it was really at, at its height. And um, you never solved it uh, before. It may seem impossible. Oh, there we go. And there's, there's some, some speed solving that goes on today. I have to say for myself. I was rubbish at the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> I, I, le I, I learned how to, how to pull them apart by force and put them back together again, but I never really learned how to do it. But um, following the Rubik's Cube, um, Erno Rubik went on and he created various variations on the cube. So there was the Rubik snake, which is also on show there. Um, but the, but there, were, there were almost um, uh, uh, countless numbers of sort of variations that came out afterwards to cash in because they were such a big seller. Yeah, and what I need to say as well, Matt, is that if, if, uh, if people looking at this will see that we've actually got videos on here showing you how to solve the Rubik's Cube in 10 minutes. Now, that's going to be something something to watch, surely. I need to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> also, another great game from the uh, era as well, the uh, the Simon, the, uh, the, 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 the memory game. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and again, it's just the colours that are, are lovely, aren't they? And they're, they're really evocative of the 80s. Um, uh, the, the, the 80s was, was kind of the decade that Star forgot, and it was a very colourful time. And uh, that, that particular toy really shows it off. It was it's basically a it is a memory game. The colours flash and you have to remember the sequence and, uh, and follow suit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, just one of the one of the many things that's uh, that's on show here. Um, and also, I just want to just nip round here and just show this one as well. People will remember this, won't they? The Speak and Spell. Speak and Spell. I mean, that was particularly immortalised by the uh, the movie E.T. Um, to construct the uh, the radar to uh, transmit E.T.'s location on Earth. Um, Elliot, you know, kind of hotwired a Speak and Spell and got that working. But um, it was cool because Speak and Spell was kind of an educational toy, but it, it was an educational toy you didn't mind playing with. So uh, everyone was learning to spell by default, you know, it's one of these great things. Absolutely. Um, oh. And, oh, I, I mustn't forget this as well down here. Who would have thought that Top Deck Shandy and, uh, and, and, and actually sweets, uh, cigarette sweets. So kids were, like, were drinking and... And, and and fagging and booze in it and it was acceptable it's inconceivable today but every single news agent in the country you could go in and you could buy your sweet cigarettes and your two percent alcohol top deck shandy and you could be puffing along on your uh, on your bmx and pretending to be to be smoking and uh, uh you know it, it just wouldn't happen today and in fact, uh, you know, the, the item on show next to that is also a McDonald's ashtray. And you could uh, you could smoke in McDonald's throughout the 80s and um, you go and have a Big Mac and a fag. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a slightly different world now, isn't it? That's incredible. And of course, on the wall over here, the, the iconic poster that everybody had, which was this man and baby, the long form. Um, I, I mean, just tell me a little bit about this. We, it, it's an, it was an incredible post. I think it sold about five million copies. It did. It was um, the biggest seller for the poster chain, Athena. And um, uh, I expect probably some of the viewers may remember that, you know, Athena was this sort of poster chain that was on most high streets. And this particular one found its way onto the wall of many um, uh, prob probably young, young, <laughs> young teenage girls. It was, uh, it was kind of a media buzzword of the new man. And the new man it sort of came up as this sort of buzzword in the 80s. It didn't really, uh, it didn't really sort of stick. But essentially, it was meant to be sort of a, a '80s man was a bit more sensitive and had a baby. Yeah. And I think everybody who had a, everybody who had a baby since has tried to re uh, do that pose, haven't they? As well, they've actually tried to uh, copy that pose, which is just great. Looking around here as well, I'll just have a look at some of these things quickly. But the body shop obviously made a big impact, didn't it, in the '80s? Um, and we've also got things like this, the, the Elix calculator pencil box, where everybody wanted one, and it, it was meaningless, really. But every, unless you got one, it was the coolest thing to have at school, wasn't it? It, it was. You know, we, we all had our pencil cases at school, and that was a particularly ubiquitous one. And, uh, you know, and the body shop, again, it was something that um, 
was aspirational for for a lot of children in the 80s and um, it also started a bit of a drive towards um you know social awareness in terms of animal testing that hadn't really been a big issue before but um uh the, the body shop's owner anita roddick really brought that issue to to the forefront and uh, all all the body shop products were, were not tested on animals and um it really created a sea change in the industry Matt, I just want to bring this in as well. So this was money in the 80s. And where we see there, we had a, a pound note. There'll be a lot of people never had one of those in their hands now. <laughs> uh, and things like the, I think it was that the BT card as well. The, um, yes. Uh, which were the BT phone card, <clears throat> which was a must-have accessory, wasn't it? If you wanted to phone that anywhere, it'd be super cool. That's right. We, we got the um, the pound coin arrived in 1983, and that, that sort of saw the end of the pound note. Um in 1984, the half penny coin was withdrawn, and um, what could you buy with a half penny? Well, you could you could buy sweets if you're a kid. You know, they they made particularly tiny little sweets that you could buy for half p. And um, also, a little bit later in the decade, as you said, the the uh, the phone card got released, so you didn't need to have ten p in your pocket to use the uh, you know the old phone boxes. You could use the phone card instead. The other big uh, uh, big news of the eighties uh, as well. Some of these toys, like the Master of the Universe. Now, this is the Castle Grey Skull. Place and we've actually got an old advert for it there as well uh, and and also let's not forget apart from uh, 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 apart from the master of the universe the other big toy i think of the era was the uh, transformers which goes on to today doesn't it with all the hollywood movies and everything but this is their this is their era this is when it began absolutely and it's really great seeing the argos catalog there because you know pre-internet that was the way as a kid that you kind of you know, looked at your wish list for Christmas or your wish list for your birthday. You'd go through that August catalogue with Biro and you uh, do do ticks next to Castle Grayskull or Optimus Prime and say those were the ones you wanted. And um, both of those toys sets came out in, in the middle of the decade. Um, He-Man uh, had its sort of peak year in 1985 and it had about 400 million in sales there. And Transformers was released in 1984. And um, as you know from the movies and whatnot, that's a franchise that's still going strong. Um, but uh, the first original toys that came out in 1984, they're called Gen 1. And, and the Gen 1 Transformers are sort of particularly sought after by collectors today. Well, look, there's a lot more to there. Um, we, we're going to uh, whiz on. And um, I'll just, um, uh, before we go any further, I'll just say that we, you can actually get really much, much closer up to this, um, this kind of thing as well. And then if we start clicking on these um, uh, posters on here, we'll see things like the Kyla Minogue, uh, I Should Be So Lucky, the 1988 classic, uh, and and obviously we've got the video content in here, the music videos, which really bring all this to life. Uh, you click on on through on YouTube, you'll actually en enlarge this, and you can actually. Well, I'm, I'll just give a quick look. There you go, look. Uh, so we can actually watch that in its entirety um, uh, on the uh, on the actual um, uh, uh, inside the exhibition. So there's some great things to look at there. Um, and also there's some great cultural uh, magazines and things down here. I'm just going to, this one that reminded me so much of the 80s was the Starburst, not least of all because it's a cinema TV fantasy magazine, but also the the, the content with uh, not least of all their Max Headroom. Uh, and again, if you click on here, there's some more video content and we'll bring this to life. And he was the, one of the first kind of pseudo digital characters, if you will, a bit of a presenter. And also some other great things apart from, uh, the likes of obviously the Beano, which is still going today, uh, uh, started back right in 1938, big in the uh, 80s. But things like these fantastic comics as well, which are worth a fortune these days. Some of them, Matt. Yeah, there's you know there's still a collector's market for um for for comics and uh, uh, and, and magazines from from back in the 80s. Um, they had a real resurgence of children's uh, magazines. They've been in decline, rather, during the 60s and 70s, and um, e everything sort of buoyed up in the 80s. Uh, Smash Hits, in particular, came out, and um, they had a million-selling issue. 1989, they actually had, a, had a, an issue that sold a million copies, which is incredible for, for a children's magazine. And um, Smash Hits, in particular, was, you know, <laughs> again, before the internet, if you wanted to find out a song's lyrics, Pretty much the only way you could find out the actual words to a song was in smash hits because uh, they often printed the uh, the lyrics to songs in their totality. I, I, I noticed as well, we've got the Sheffield's own Human League here on the front cover, who obviously had the big massive it with Don't You Want Me. But I think this um, this this cover was actually from, uh, I think we got the date in here somewhere, April uh, 28th, 1983. So anybody, any aficionados out there will tell you that I think they've just had a smash hit 
with, um, I think it was, keep feeling fascination. So there you go. That's my bit of 80s knowledge for you. Uh, but the one that we all uh, remember as well from that period was the Live Aid concert. Now, this were in, was incredible. Uh, it actually started, didn't it, with the... Um, uh, with the with with the Christmas hit, which went went to number one, obviously, and raised I think about eight million pounds in its own right. The uh, do they know it's Christmas? And then that that summer, um, both Bob Geldof uh, of the Boomtown Rats and Ms. Year of Ultra Walks, the front man, they got this fantastic concert together where it was actually from Wembley Stadium and, and John F. Kennedy in, uh, Stadium in Philadelphia, um, and it was well. I mean, I think it's gone on to raise some like thirty three million or something, which in those days, I mean, back in the not mid eighties. That was just like it was the biggest program that had ever been seen on TV. I think, uh, Mark. I've got the I've got the program there on show for people to see the the original souvenir program. I wanted to get a ticket as well, um, and you could buy them on eBay. You know, they sort of came up every now and then. They're usually sort of eighty to hundred pounds, and I was sort of sitting on my hands. And I probably should have bought one because then the movie Bohemian Rhapsody came out last year. And they had that amazing recreation of Live Aid at the end of the film. Uh, and, and now tickets to Live Aid are, are three or four times they were <laughs> back back then. So uh, uh, I should have bought one back when I had the chance before before they, they cost a fortune. But it was an amazing event. And um, a, a, again, it was a real seminal moment. 1985, right in the middle of the decade. Um, and then I'm just going to look at some of these fantastic movie covers. I mean, each one of these tells a story, whether it's Eurythmics, David Bowie, um, I think there's a break dance, uh, which was connected with the with the uh, with the movie. We've got Grace Jones, Cindy Lauper, and even Spitting Image, which was made a comeback. So uh, if, if you go on here, there's even the uh, the novelty song, which was the chicken song, which I'm sure a lot of people uh, have never heard of. But check it out; it's a lot of fun. Um, Matt, you can actually spend hours in here just looking around this, and and I think you know the exhibition in its own right is fabulous. Um, but I'm also just thinking that what we've done to it here in terms of virtually has added another dimension, haven't we? I think you have. Yeah, it it, it really allows you to, uh, to to dig a bit deeper into everything and it, it all comes to life. Um, you know, I, I still think there's no substitute for sort of, you know, visiting a place and seeing these objects in the flesh. But um, this gives you, a, a, as you say, it gives you a whole new dimension and you can you can really drill down and find out a bit more and actually see stuff firsthand. It is. It, it 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 is just absolutely terrific. Um, I'm just going to. Um, I'm just going to actually just very quickly just remind people uh, with a little bit of video again, just to show them this. And while I'm doing that, Matt, um, I'm just going to say a big shout out to lots of people who are joining us tonight. So uh, we've got uh, Caroline uh, Wibbly who's saying, "Oh, interesting." Well, it, it really is, Caroline, um, and she does say no ABC, but we're going to fix that. I think, Matt. <coughs> we. Um, I've also got uh, Davinia Porter saying, looks great. That's fabulous. Thanks, Davinia. Uh, Amelia Grant saying, I was born in 1972. Well, you certainly will have remembered the 80s then. Um, and uh, Stuart Ogle saying, watching from uh, Intake Sheffield. Uh, we've got, um, please jump on here. Tell us where you're watching from and tell us what your memories are of the 80s. And, and if you've actually got any questions from that as well, this is a great opportunity to uh, Fire him up some questions, and um, he'll, uh, we'll put him on the spot, see if we can get him to answer any of this as well. Um, uh, we've got lots of people who are, who are watching it um, uh, and um, uh, uh, watching on many many sites tonight, not least of all on the um, uh, the Barnsley Museum site. I'm just going to remind people what what we're, what we are and what, where we're at again today. So this is the I grew up in the 80s, and uh, we're live. Uh, and I've been joined by uh, Matt uh, Fox, who's the curator. Uh, Matt, um, no matter where you are in the world, you've got memories of the 1980s. So I guess we could have people from from anywhere looking at this. Yeah, I've tried to um, I've tried to really sort of reflect the the British experience um, of the 80s because we, we you know there, there is a sort of certain multiculturalism and globalism today, but. Um, in the 80s, uh, it was probably a little bit more provincial. Um, uh, although we, we did take certain things from other cultures, for example, when it came to movies, um, you know, the kind of films that kids went to see at their local ABC or the local Odeon, they all came from the same place. They all came from America. Um, you know, the foreign films and, and even were, were a little bit too arty. British films, you know, Room with a View, that type of thing, were a little bit too stiff. So. Um, 
you'll find actually the top 20 biggest UK box offices all came from one place. They all came from Hollywood. And uh, we're going to have a look at the films in a minute, I think. Yeah, we are. We're, gonna, we, we, we're certainly going to do that. Um, I just want to point out as well, we've had a, um, a comment from, uh, from Experience Barnes itself. Uh, and um, just remind us that because of your generosity and because of uh, the lockdown, this exhibition is actually going to be extended, isn't it? It's not just to March now, it's until through until April. Yes, it is. Yeah, we've obviously lost a bit of time, you know, uh, through nobody's fault because of uh, uh, because of the lockdown. So we're, we're going to have the exhibition um, available for longer and hopefully uh, happier days are coming for all, all of us in the country. And um, you'll be able to get in there and, and, and visit the exhibition in person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got um, 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 some other people who, are, who have commented on this as well. I've got uh, one from... Um, Amelia Grant, uh, who's saying to me uh, she can't wait to come and see this exhibition once it uh, actually goes live. And, um, uh, uh, well, it is live in, in as much as it being virtual. It is built, as we can see. Uh, but the thing is, uh, it's still unacceptable. Uh, people can't get in there because uh, because of the co of the COVID and the lockdown. But, Amelia, uh, like we've said, it will go through now until... Um, uh, April and she's saying it all looks amazing uh, best memories uh, the 80s and I think for many people they are um, we've also got um, uh, various people including um, Michelle uh, Morrill who was watching with us uh, Lisa Clark um, lots and lots of people please tell us where you're watching from folks as well um, and like I say if you've got any questions for Matt if we get, if we don't get round to them all um, tonight because obviously um, time's pressing I know that you want you want to be doing other things um just ask, uh, just 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 ask the questions on the on the post, and, and we will get round to it, and we'll uh, we'll answer as many as we can. So I'm just going to show you there. We had the, uh, the the jukebox wall uh, where we've got all the video content. And again, like I say, if you click onto these, you'll actually bring up and be able to watch the music videos like Rio with Duran Duran, and it brings back so many memories. We've got a wall here as well, uh, full of uh, videos uh, from the Ritz which was, a, was a, 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 a very popular in its time uh, rental company. And then we've got these fantastic film posters like the Terminator, uh, the uh, uh, Goonies, uh, the, we've got the uh, Dirty Dancing, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, some fantastic things. And just to remind you, when you do click on these, not only will you get lots of information about the actual uh, movie uh, and 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 other things but uh, including uh, wikipedia content you can go look at but actually you get the movie trailers on here as well so it's just great great fun uh, before we look at the other movies that's up on them in fact let's look at them now because some of these are my favorites of all time so we've got uh, indiana jones uh we've got et now i mean it just it was the decade that kept on giving matt it was not. I, you know, I, I particularly love the movie posters of the 80s because uh, the majority of them were hand painted. So um, you, you had, for example, uh, an artist called John Alvin um, painting the, uh, the, the the Raiders one. And um, uh, the E.T. The e. poster next to it was sort of painted like Michelangelo, uh, the Sistine Chapel. It's sort of a homage to the uh, creation of Adam uh, on the Sistine Chapel. And um, crucially, you just see E.T.'s hand, you know, uh, the, the advertising campaign in the lead up. To ET being released, I can I can still remember this. They didn't reveal what ET looked like, so every kid, you know, really wanted to know what does ET look like. You know, we had this hype of this movie, and uh, it, it preserved the mystery on that poster. It did absolutely fantastic. And again, like I say, you click on it, you'll see. In fact, if you do what I do, I, I looked at the, all these post, uh, posters and all the movie clips, Matt, and it made me want to go and actually see uh, more of the uh, actually watch the films. And I've done that, particularly things like Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I think there's, a, there's another final Raiders coming out as well. I think he's actually going to get the hat and the whip out for one last time, if I'm right, Matt. Oh, I, th I think he may well be. And, you know, the, the other, you know, amazing thing about the movies of the 80s was it was pre-CG. So everything had to be done in camera. You know, there was no digital trickery. The stuntmen really had to go um, and crawl underneath the truck in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, it, it, it was just... The movies had a great sense of optimism, great sense of fun. And, um, you know, as I said, a lot of the bleak sort of discomforting cinema of the 70s was really sort of washed away from the success of Star Wars at the end of that decade. So the 80s was a real period where uh, there, there was just feel good, uh, entertaining, pure entertainment the movies were back then. 
And the other thing, Matt, as well, um, that we saw here as well is this Footloose and, and these fantastic um, movie musicals, really, I suppose, of the 80s. There were some just great films out there, wasn't there? Uh, there were, and um, a lot of films in the 80s were kind of based around the soundtrack. You know, the soundtrack albums were so successful. So you had the likes of Footloose and Dirty Dancing oh. that really uh, sold on the soundtracks. And yeah. um, they also delivered a, a pretty positive message to the kids of the day that, you know, if you think films like Karate Kid, Footloose, Dirty Dancing, they're all about sort of trying hard, you know, listening to the right people, you know, practice makes perfect and uh, and you'll succeed. So it, it was a good positive message behind them. Absolutely. Um, I also, um, we're looking at some of the fashions down here as well. Now, the fashions, they were iconic, weren't they? Because you had two, it was uh, really, it was a game of two halves, wasn't it? The, the 80s, we had the, the, the kind of the, the cheap, bright shell suits, rah-rah skirts, leg warmers. And then we moved into the Dallas period where we had all the kind of the big air and the big suits and all the rest of it. It was, it was an incredible era. Yeah, it, it was, it was a, it was a great era for fashion. And, uh, you know, I go in the high street shops now and um, there's so much of this stuff has come back around, you know, pink hot leopard prints and all that kind of thing. Um, they all seem to be making a bit of a comeback at the moment. Um, there wasn't, you know, a single fashion in the eighties, obviously, um, as, as you say, there were different um, sort of cliques, I guess, would wear different types of clothes. But um, the, I guess the main characteristics were, were that it was kind of a little bit colourful, a little bit lurid, and um, uh, particularly <laughs> particularly strong with geometric lines and that type of thing. And uh, you've got an example there of shoulder pads, you've got the rah-rah skirt, you've got the classic shell suit, um, the, um, the the usually Italian polo shirts that guys used to wear, Tashini and um, LS and all of those labels that we used to love. And even <laughs> yeah, the cowboy boots it, it? made famous by George yeah, Michael. The yeah. cowboy boots. Yeah, the cowboy boots. And of course, the 80s, we also had these fantastic bikes. In fact, I think we had the first computer bike, which is uh, which is this one right here, um, um, which is the Rally uh, Vector BMX. And if we click on there, we've actually come see some um, video content you can hear the noises and and all the rest of it and bring it all together um and uh oh hey we've got a special guest that's joined us <laughs> we've, got, we've got a special this is this is my my cavapoo luna uh she can say hello to everybody here, here she is Hi, luna. <laughs> oh. <laughs> does, she, does she remember the 80s <laughs> <laughs> i don't know she's she just heard something and made it made a barking but calm down darling. Oh. there we go <laughs> so just going, just yes. well, the beauty the beauty of doing these things from all mate eh? yeah so the rally vector was a cross between a bmx and a zx spectrum it will it was um i guess riding on the success of tv shows like knight rider and street hawk they thought if they can sort of make a a computer bmx then all the kids would absolutely love it um what they didn't reckon on was how much it was going to cost um, it was uh, about £300 at retail, which is about £1,000 in today's money. So very expensive for a children's bike. And also how much it would weigh. And this thing, you know, I, I've had to ship it around myself. It's, it's 20 kilograms. So uh, imagine trying to sort of cycle up your local hill, you know, as, as a 10-year-old on a 20-kilogram bike. And uh, you're not going to get too far. So like the Sinclair C5, it was a fantastic folly that there's, didn't really work. There's another one here, Matt, as well, which is this uh, rally uh, uh, burner. Now, this that looks a lot like a chopper bike from the 70s as well, doesn't it? The rally but the rally burner, that, that's the BMX that did get it right. That was the big seller, and um, it sold over half a million BMXs for rally. Um, it came out very fortuitously in the same year as E.T., and uh, E.T., as you may remember, really sort of like made a star of the BMX bike because all the kids in E.T., you know, had that amazing BMX chase. So um, it came out right at the same time as that. And, and it was huge. And uh, I, I just think BMXs are, are an absolute design classic from the era. I, lo I love them. Yeah, and still around today, you know, and that's the um, that's always the test of a good um, a classic, isn't it? How long how long it lasts. So um, we, we've pretty much come uh, round uh, towards the end of our journey. But before we do that, Matt, I just want to just remind people there's other things as well. So we've got here, a, um, I grew up in the 80s EMAG, which is an activity booklet. Um, and if you click on this, I'll just try and do that. If you actually click on here, it takes you through to um, this fantastic booklet that's been produced by Barnes & Council. And again, you, you can pick copies of it up uh, when... Um, when, when everything's back up and running again. But for now, we've got this uh, page-turning version of it. 
So you can make your own Pac-Man board game. Um, we've got here how you can. This is, I've got to do this. You've got how you can bake your own giant lion bar. And actually, I probably need to do this as well on the left-hand page. How to turn yourself into a transformer with some <laughs> with some cardboard boxes. Uh, we've also got uh, in here as well an Indiana Jones game as well, uh, scavenger cards that. So you can actually um, uh, with this, you can actually um, <clears throat> you can actually download it. Um, so you, you can download this onto your computer and you can <clears throat> print all this off and actually create that uh, that fantastic uh, uh, that can fantastic experience. Uh, the other thing that this does as well, um, and I'll just I'll just try and show it, is that uh, on the back we've also got a, a, a lot of these things click through. So if you click on here, there's actually a special Rubik's cube that's been created by Barnes and Museums. Um, hopefully this is going to come up and I can show you it. Um, but it's actually, um, here we go, um, it's actually made of all the fantastic uh, pictures from the 80s. Um, and um, you can actually have a play around with it and do what you want with it and then try and solve it. And if you can't solve it, there's an unscramble button at the bottom here. So there you go. So, but the best thing to do is to probably actually watch the uh, uh, watch the video that we've got on there on how to solve the, the Rubik's cube. But again, some great activities in this um, in this fantastic. Uh, I've just gone to full screen onto this fantastic booklet. So have a look at that. Um, and of course, we've also got here um, we've got a donations book box now. Please, guys, if um, if you can help us out, I mean, obviously donations have fallen off a bit of a cliff. I think, as Ian McMillan's been saying, if um, who was one of my my buddies and he's done a little video for us. But if you can make a donation, then visit uh, bmht.org, which is the Barnsley Museum's Heritage Trust. I'm proud to be a trustee of that, uh, and you can make a donation there. Or now you can actually donate uh, by texting ex Barnsley and your donation amount, whether that's five, ten. Twenty pounds, wherever you want to donate to seven hundred eight five. So that's two great ways of doing that. Um, and um, and when you come in here, you'll find out a little bit more. And there's links as well that will take you to some of those sites. And Ian McMillan, the uh, poet in lockdown, as we like to call him, uh, the Bard of Barnsley, he's done a special little video as well um, that um, uh, well just encourages people to donate. Uh, and here's what here's what Ian had to say. Hello everybody, Ian McMillan here, still in lockdown, still in need of a haircut. I'm a proud member of the Barnsley Museums and Heritage Trust and like everybody else I've been so impressed by the amazing work they've done during this crisis. Those online jigsaws have stumped me but my wife can do them very easily. What's happened though is because the museums aren't open the amount of donations we're getting has really fallen off a cliff. We're not getting any donations in because nobody's visiting to put money in the box. So what I'm asking is, if you've enjoyed our online content, if you love the museums as much as I do, then could you please just give us a little donation, whatever you can afford, and that'll ensure that our work carries on as the crisis carries on, and it carries on beyond the crisis to the new normal where museums will be as vital as ever, if not more so. So um, I think that um, we had um, obviously that was uh, that was Ian McMillan, my buddy, and he was just giving a, a little shout out there, really, just to uh, make a, a donation. Uh, and if you could, that would be absolutely fantastic. And um, again, um, the, the uh, we, we've actually got uh, opportunities where you can do that online uh, right here. Um, and if not, then um, uh, again, um, you can actually do it by visiting uh, the bmht.org. Uh, or you can actually uh, make a donation by text these days to text EX Barnsley. Um, so there, there we go, Matt. I think that's uh, pretty much um, that's pretty much our uh, little tour of this done. But um, if people want to go on and explore it, the links on this post. Um, j j just tell me what it means to you to actually be able to actually have an exhibition open during lockdown. It's it's fantastic. Uh, the um... There's an old saying that uh, collecting is a sickness and sharing it is the only cure. So I'm, I'm a, a, able to sort of share it with you guys um, during this lockdown is, is, is a real special thing. So I do hope that people um, enjoy having a look at all of these objects uh, that we've put together to represent the decade. And um, 
uh, I, I hope that, as, as Ian said, that you may make a donation as well to Experience Barnsley because this is all provided for free. So uh, thanks very much for having me on on this and uh, and and for Luna to say goodbye now. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. It has been a pleasure, Matt. And um, to be honest with you, I can't think of a, a better evening than uh, we could have had than uh, <clears throat> exploring this uh, together, which has been real fun, hasn't it? Um, I, I think before we go as well, um, just to, a big shout out for Barnsley Museums. who are doing some splendid work. And in fact, um, they've, um, they've also uh, done a, a brilliant mapping of um, uh, I'm going to try and put it up here if I can, if I can just find it. They've done a, a brilliant mapping of uh, Cannon Hall. Um, now, this is going to go live um, to the general public um, later on this, um, oh, well, I think next month, back end of this month, um, uh, next month. Uh, and there's a little bit of video I just wanted to show just again, just to show how, how cool this is. Um, <clears throat> And so this is a this is looking at the Cannon Hall, which is one of the five museums that Barnsley Museums and Heritage Trust run. Um, and if we take you into it, well, I'll just let it speak for itself. So, yeah, like I was saying, uh, I mean, it's just magnificent, isn't it, Matt, uh, that we can do things like this, uh, and particularly at this time when uh, normally, you know, people are not being able to even get out of their house where people can explore. Um, <clears throat> but the main focus, obviously, tonight is uh, the um, I grew up in the 80s, uh, and there's a link on this post so that straight after this, uh, if you want to go on and explore and have a look at all that uh, magnificent uh, exhibition that we've just been looking at then uh, feel free to do it Matt, any uh, any final words of advice about people uh, who, 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 are, who are looking forward to coming and watching this uh, exhibition uh, when when they can well we're going to find out in a few days time um what the uh, the you know the tier and the uh, the instructions are so please do keep an eye out on the experience policy website and on their Facebook page to find out when it will actually reopen physically and you'll be able to go in there. But um, it's going to be on there for a good old while into next year. So hopefully um, you'll have a chance to go in there. And, um, yeah, you know, when you do visit, it's it's not a quiet contemplation. It's go in there and have a chat and talk about it and uh, take your children and show them uh, the things that you experienced when you were their age. And so it's a really nice uh, exhibition for the family to enjoy. Yeah, I think the other thing to uh, just to mention, Matt, as well, is uh, quite remarkably that um, you're in, I think it's uh, Canterbury, about 250 miles away. So we've saved you an eight-hour round trip coming to Barnsley to uh, officially open this exhibition. How does that feel? Wonders of technology, eh? Yes, that's great, you know, and it's, it, I guess that, that's one of the bonuses that uh, perhaps uh, our, our sort of work-life balance and our, uh, our, our travel around the country is going to be reduced a little bit because we've got uh, all, all of these, um, uh, you know, uh, video, video calls that we can do now and uh, it all seems to work pretty well, doesn't it? Thanks for, thanks for hosting it as well, I should say, uh, Graham. No, it's been terrific. I, I've, I've, I've much enjoyed it. The 80s and the 60s are probably my two favourite decades, but... Um, so I don't know. We'll have to get you doing more. Hey, who knows? We might get uh, I, uh, an I grew up in the 90s one as well. I'm sure that the likes of Oasis and and uh, 
Stone Roses fans would love that. Um, and, and I'm sure we could uh, look at others as well. Anyway, listen, Matt, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, and thanks, folks, for watching tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please do two things for me. Click on the link and go and have a look at this um, uh, virtual tour. It is free. Um, it is a, one of the wonders of, of what Barnsley Council and Barnsley Museum Service have been doing. There's many, many more of these to come as well. So um, keep watching out, as um, um, Matt was saying, for advice where you can find out more information. In fact, I've already put some things up here, like uh, the Twitter accounts for Experience Barnsley, not least of all for Barnsley Museums. Um, and uh, I also want to obviously give a big shout out to the Museums and Heritage Trust, um, who are doing a, a fabulous job. And just another final plug there for um, texting a few pennies as well to make these things happen. Um, I'm just going to play you out uh, again with another little look at what we've just been looking at, uh, which is a little bit of video um, of this uh, fantastic exhibition. But uh, like I say, the two things to do, please jump on this on this post, click on, go and have a look at it. And secondly, drop a couple of coins in the, uh, in the donation box if you've enjoyed it. And we've uh, rekindled a few great memories for you tonight. My name is Graham Walker. Um, whatever you're doing for the rest of the evening, have a great time and thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.